were convicted of the murder of Clive Lizard Williams, to whom I shall refer as the deceased. At trial, the prosecution case was that the deceased and another man, Leymar Chow, had been given two unlicensed firearms belonging to Palmer for safekeeping. On the 16th of August 2011, Campbell summoned Chow and the deceased to Palmer's house after they had failed to comply with Palmer's deadline for returning weapons. All right, Mr. Houston again. Tell me about this video I know. Palmer, Jones, and Simpson, and that Chow and the deceased were both attacked, after which Chow saw the deceased lying motionless on the ground with Jones bending over him. Give me some likes, funny video. Hashtag free word boss. But the deceased was never seen again. Police attended Palmer's house on the 22nd of August 2011. They noticed the house smelled of disinfectant. On the 25th of August, they cordoned off the perimeter wall, treating the premises as a crime scene. When they returned on the 27th of August, they found that the entire interior of the house had been destroyed by fire. On the 29th of August, the police forensics reported a foul odor emanating from the living room. On a further visit on the 30th of September, it was discovered that the rear of the house had been demolished. Police dug at the premises but did not find a body. The police seized the mobile phones of Palmer and Simpson. Text messages, voice notes, and a video from those phones were put in evidence at the trial. The prosecution also relied on telecommunications data which the police had obtained from Digicel a communications provider. The prosecution case was that the mobile phone evidence and telecommunications data, taken as a whole with Chow's evidence, proved the fact of the killing, the reason for the killing, the method of disposal of the deceased's body, and the identity of at least one of the killers, Henry Palmer. The four appellants each denied murdering the deceased. At trial, the appellants objected to the telecommunications data being admitted as evidence. They argued that the data was inadmissible because it had been obtained in breach of the Interception of Communications Act and the fundamental right to the protection and privacy of communications guaranteed by the Charter of Fundamental Rights and Freedoms contained in the Jamaican Constitution. The judge admitted the evidence. He ruled that the data could be relied upon by the prosecution even if it had been obtained in breach of the Charter or the Interception of Communications Act. Over the course of a 64-day trial, there occurred a series of incidents involving the jury. The jury was reduced to 11 members after a jury was discharged almost eight weeks into the trial. On the final day of the trial, it was brought to the judge's attention that a member of the jury who will be referred to as Jura X, had attempted to bribe other members of the jury. The judge questioned the jury foreman, who stated that Jura X had offered bribes to each of the other jurors to acquit the appellants. The judge asked counsel for the prosecution and the defense if the trial could continue. It would not have been possible for me to discharge Jura X, because under the Jury Act, a trial for murder cannot continue with fewer than 11 jurors. The judge decided to proceed with his summing up and gave a direction to the jury, reminding them of their function. The jury retired to consider his verdict at 3.42 p.m. The jury returned at 6.08 p.m. and by a majority of 10 to 1, convicted all four appellants of the deceased's murder. A fifth defendant was unanimously acquitted. Jura X was immediately yeah, one, yeah, one, 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 of attempting to pervert the course of justice. There was no evidence to connect his activities with the appellants. The appellants appealed against their conviction to the Court of Appeal of Jamaica, which dismissed their appeals. The Court of Appeal granted permission to appeal to the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council on three grounds, which were, first, that the trial judge failed properly to inquire into allegations of juror misconduct. Secondly, that the trial judge departed from standard practice in inviting the jury to retire to consider their verdict so late in the day, putting undue pressure on them to reach a verdict. And thirdly, that the trial judge erred 
him admitting the telecommunications data because it had been obtained in breach of the Interception Communications Act and the Charter. The Judicial Committee of the Privy Council has unanimously concluded that the appeals should be allowed and the appellant's convictions should be quashed on the ground of juror misconduct and that the case should be remitted to the Court of Appeal of Jamaica to decide whether to order a retrial of the appellants for the murder of Clive Williams. The Board has a considerable sympathy with the dilemma faced by the trial judge on the final day of a long and complex trial. Following the allegations of bribery, he had either to continue with the 11 remaining jurors or to discharge the jury. Despite this, the board considers that the approach taken by the judge was a material irregularity in the course of the trial, which makes it necessary to quash the convictions. This is for three reasons. First, the direction to the jury on the final day was inadequate to save the situation. The judge simply reminded the jury that they had sworn or affirmed that they would return verdicts in accordance with the evidence they had heard in court. The judge did not refer to the alleged bribery, of which, if the allegations were true, the jurors were already aware. Secondly, the trial continued with the allegedly corrupt jurors serving as one of its 11 members. In the board's view, there should have been no question of allowing juror X to continue to serve on the jury. Allowing juror X to remain on the jury is fatal to the safety of the convictions which followed. It was an infringement of the appellant's fundamental right to a fair hearing under the Jamaican Constitution. Thirdly, the judge should have considered whether the remaining jurors might have become consciously or unconsciously prejudiced for or against one or more of the appellants as a result of juror X's behavior. For example, there was a danger that the attempted bribe could have made the other jurors overcompensate consciously or unconsciously if they assumed that the offer must have come from one of the appellants and that therefore they must be guilty. The judge took no account of this risk. The board is very mindful of the serious consequences which may flow from having to discharge a jury shortly before the end of a long and complex criminal trial. It is also very conscious of the danger of deliberate attempts to derail criminal trials by engineering situations in which it is necessary to discharge the jury. In England and Wales, there is legislation which allows a judge in certain situations to discharge a jury because of jury tampering and to continue the trial by judge alone. There is no such legislation in Jamaica. It follows that there will be occasions where, as in this case, a court will have no alternative but to discharge a jury and end the trial in order to protect the integrity of the system of trial by jury. In view of its conclusion on the issue of juror misconduct, the board holds that it is not necessary to express a concluded view on the other two grounds of appeal. For these reasons, the appellant's appeals should be allowed. The court is now adjourned.